Good evening. Let's open tonight's service with hymn number 24 from the Spiral Gospel Hymns Hymn Book number 24. Jehovah Sid Kenu, the Lord, our righteousness. Let's all stand together. <clears throat> Sit can you the Lord our righteousness? We love to call you by that name, our Savior Christ Jesus. Jehovah Sid can you the God man live for us? Bring Eternal righteousness which God imputes to us. Jehovah Sid Kenu, our substitute who died, your blood has put away our sin, and we are justified. Jehovah Sid Kenu, your love has won our praise, trusting your blood and righteousness, we're saved by your free grace. Jehovah Sid Kenu, we stand in you alone. Our only fitness before God is in our Lord, His Son. Jehovah Seed Kenu, the Lord our righteousness. Christ Jesus, you alone we call the Lord our righteousness. Please be seated. Good evening. <clears throat> We're going to be reading from Psalm 118 for our call to worship. <clears throat> you know, there's a bright side of these masks. Some of y'all look better with them on. <clears throat> oh, I hope we don't have to do this long. <clears throat> but I'm thankful we have an opportunity to be back together. <clears throat> Psalm 118, beginning of verse 1. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Because his mercy endureth forever. Let Israel now say that his mercy endureth forever. Let the house of Aaron now say that his mercy endureth forever. Let them now that fear the Lord say that his mercy endureth forever. Now notice the word endureth is in italics. And it gives the idea that mercy has a beginning and lasts forever. Uh, but the word endureth is not in the text. His mercy is forever. In other words, it never had a beginning, and it never has an end. It's everlasting. I called upon the Lord in distress, and the Lord answered me and set me in a large place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what man can do unto me. If God be for me, who can be against me? The Lord taketh my part with them that help me. Therefore shall I see my desire upon them that hate me. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Our confidence is in our God who is able to do all things and does all things well. <clears throat> I want us to uh, pray together tonight. I've got a uh, 
most of you all not met Walter Groover, you knew Cody, um, and Walter is Cody's father. Walter and Betty moved to Mexico in 1964 and didn't speak Spanish, believing that God had called them to preach the gospel there, and they never left. They raised their children there, and, um, and the Lord has, over the years, raised up several gospel churches in and around uh, Medida, where Walter has been all these years. Uh, Walter's just been diagnosed with bone cancer. Uh, it's in advanced stages, and uh, he's uh, not going to do any treatments. They're going to try to mitigate the pain. And he told Betty, he said, uh, he said, the one thing I look forward to is going to services on Wednesday and Sunday. He said, if I can, if I can make it to the doctor's office, I can make it to church. <laughs> so, uh, dear, dear brother, pray for Walter and for Betty. Uh, their daughter, Lisa, is down there helping to take care of them. Um, also, uh, Jessica Clark had her surgery uh, Monday and um, had her uh, uh, colon resected and liver pump put in for her cancer. Um, she's uh, doing, uh, recovering. She's, uh, Brad says she's doing very well, <laughs> spiritually and physically and <clears throat> Um, our daughter Jennifer goes to Mayo uh, tomorrow uh, for uh, some tests. So uh, got a lot of folks to pray for. Uh, Lynn Nybert, as you most of you know, Todd's wife has had um, um, uh, kidney disease all her life, and uh, it has gotten to the point to where she has to have a transplant. So um, they're going to go this week and try to get her uh, on the list for a transplant surgery. <clears throat> I called upon the Lord in my distress, and he heard my cry. Let's, uh, let's call upon the Lord. Our merciful Heavenly Father, we come into thy holy presence thanking you that we have Thy dear Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, has all our righteousness before Thee. Thank You for His precious shed blood that has put away our sins and justified us in Thy sight. Lord, thank You for the Holy Spirit that gives faith and eyes to see and hearts to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask that You would send Your Spirit tonight in power and that You would cause Christ to be lifted up that our hearts would be drawn to him, and that our, our faith would be placed on him, and, Lord, that you would increase us in, um, in faith and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless your word to our hearts. We uh, pray for Betty and Walter, and thank you, Lord, for the encouragement that they've been over these years to your church and to your people, and pray for your hand of Mercy to be upon them and for you to provide all that they need in these uh, difficult days. And Father, we uh, thank you for the successful surgery that you gave to Jessica uh, Monday and pray for your hand of strength and healing to continue to be on her. And thank you for the expression of, of rejoicing and, and hope and mercy and faith that Brad and Jessica have been able to give in this time. Father, we uh, pray for Jennifer and ask that you'd give the doctors the wisdom that they need to make a good diagnosis and good treatment and give her uh, strength and grace. And Father, we pray for, for Lynn and ask, Lord, that you would provide uh, for her in this time and that there would be a donor that would fit and, Lord, that you would uh, give her um, your hand of strength and, and healing. We ask it all in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Number 168 in your hardback hymnal, 168. <clears throat> Let's stand once again. Oh, 
Lord, I hear of showers of blessing. Thou art scattering full and free. Showers the thirsty land refreshing. Let some drops now fall on me, even me, even me. Let thy blessing fall on me. Pass me not, O tender Savior, let me love and cling to thee. I am longing for thy favor, while thou art calling, O oh, call me. Even me, even me, let thy blessing fall on me. Pass me not, O oh, mighty Spirit, Thou canst make the blind to see. Witnesser of Jesus' merit, speak the word of power to me. Even me, even me, let thy blessing fall on me. Love of God so pure and changeless, blood of Christ so rich and free. Grace of God so strong and boundless, magnify them all in me. Even me, even me, let thy blessing fall on me. Pass me not thy lost one bringing, bind my heart, O Lord, to thee. While the streams of life are springing, blessing others, O bless me. Even me, even me, let thy blessing fall on me. Please be seated. We you open your Bibles with me to Psalm 116? Well, Psalm 116. <clears throat> Cyril and Lenore will be heading back north uh, Sunday, I think, right? Uh, we'll miss you guys. <clears throat> and uh, Fred and Mary Jane, I think, are leaving next week to go back up north. Um, <clears throat> always a sad time this time of year when our snowbirds start flying north. But uh, we'll miss you. <clears throat> Psalm 116 is a almost spontaneous, heartfelt prayer of praise and faith and rejoicing expressed to God at a time of great difficulties, yes, even death. We have rejoiced in being able to understand these psalms as they speak prophetically of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that our Lord was on the cross for six hours, and yet we only have a few words that are recorded in scriptures that he actually spoke during that time. Yet we know that his heart... And was in constant fellowship with the Father the entire time he was there. And uh, I just am certain that Psalm 116 is one of those prayers that he expressed uh, to his Father 
in his time of death. That's, that's really what this psalm is about. Um, I've titled this psalm, verse 10, you'll notice, I believed, therefore I have spoken. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ had perfect faith. He believed God till his dying breath when he cried, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. He trusted the Father to reward him for the fulfillment of the covenant promises that he was making ultimately in his death. The scripture said he was obedient even unto death, yea, even the death of the cross. So the, the, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ being accomplished for the redemption of his people on Calvary's cross was an, a sacrifice that he was offering to the Father in obedience to the promise that he had made to the Father before the foundation of the world. And in Psalm 116, our Lord is expressing his reliance upon the Father to raise him from the dead. Now, faith is expressed um, most clearly in prayer. That's, uh, that's, where we, that's where we express our faith, is in our prayers. And James tells us that we're to pray in faith. Uh, if any man, James chapter 1, if any man lack wisdom, and we know that the Lord Jesus Christ is made of God to be our wisdom, so we're always seeking to know more of the Lord Jesus Christ. And James says, if any man lack wisdom, if you want to know more about Christ, let him ask of God. But let him ask in faith. Nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like the waves of the sea, tossed to and fro. Uh, let not that man think that he shall receive anything from the Lord, for he is double-minded and unstable in all of his ways. Now, what does that mean to be double-minded and unstable in all our ways? Let me ask you a question. Do you feel most of the time that you're double-minded? And unstable in all your ways? Do you find yourself to be a contradiction to yourself? Do you find your, your flesh warring against your spirit and your spirit against your flesh so that you cannot be what you would be? <laughs> That's every believer's experience. That's not what James is talking about when he says, let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like the waves of the sea, tossed to and fro, double-minded and unstable in all of his ways, let not that man think that he should receive anything from the Lord. To be double-minded, to be unstable in all of our ways, to be tossed to and fro, is to mix works and grace. That's what it is. It's to approach the throne of God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, along with something that you've done, <laughs> some work that you've performed. In other words, it's to rely upon not only what God's done, but what you have done for your access into the presence of God. You're coming before the throne of God, not before the throne of grace, but before the throne of law. And, uh, and God says that that's being unstable. And double-minded. And let not that man think that he shall receive anything from the Lord. But they that come before him must come in faith. If any man lack wisdom, let him, let him ask it of God, who gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not. But let him ask in faith. What is it to ask in faith? It's to come into the presence of God... Trusting that the Lord Jesus Christ himself is all your righteousness and all your justification before God. That's what it is to pray in faith. 
Let me read a statement that I wrote. Faith is not believing that you are going to get something from God. Faith is not coming into the presence of God, believing that you're going to get what you asked for. And if you just believe strong enough, God will reward you for the strength of your faith, and he'll give you that. That's not faith. No, James goes on to say that you, 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 you have not because you ask not, but when you do ask, you ask amiss that you might consume it upon your own lust. In other words, when we pray, we have to say, Father, if it be thy will, we, don't, we, we often don't know what God's will is in terms of, of, of things that we have in this world. Well, faith is not believing that you're going to get something from God. Faith is believing that God gave to his son everything that he asked for and that your only hope to receive anything from God is to come into his holy presence looking in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ for all of your righteousness and looking in faith to his shed blood on Calvary's cross for all your justification before God. That's what faith, that's what praying in faith is. <laughs> and that's, <clears throat> that's how we come, isn't it? That's how we come. And in that regard, we would not dare enter into the presence of God and present anything that we've done for our acceptance with God. In that regard, we're, we're not double-minded. We're not unstable. We're, we're faith looks to Christ alone for all the hope of our salvation, for all our righteousness and all of our justification. And faith believes that God gave to him everything he asked for. Everything he asked for. Because everything he asked for was in, was in perfect obedience with the will of God, and was asked for in perfect faith. Now Psalm 116 is the Lord Jesus Christ pouring out his heart to the Father. And faith is, you and I, for, for us, faith is believing that what Christ is pleading with his Father for here, the Father gave him. And the only hope that we have for the Father to give us anything is to believe that the Lord Jesus Christ was faithful and successful in everything the Father sent him to do. That's why he said, I believed, therefore have I spoken. <laughs> I've expressed my heart to God in faith. And in that regard, that's exactly what we do. We can say, I believe. I do believe. I believe the Lord Jesus Christ is the only hope. We just sang, we just sang, Jehovah said, can you, the Lord our righteousness. I believe that, the, that if I have any righteousness before God, it's going to be bound up 100% in him. And if there's any hope, any hope whatsoever that my sins are going to be put away from the presence of God, they're going to have to be covered by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> All my justification and all my righteousness. And so let him ask in faith. In faith. Nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like the waves of the sea. Tossed to and fro. Tossed to works. Tossed to grace. Tossed to works. Oh no. <laughs> we believe. Therefore we have spoken. Turn to me to... Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Because Paul quotes from Psalm 116 in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Look at verse 6. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, 
hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And when the light of the gospel shines in our hearts, that, that light reveals us for what we are. So that we're able to say, there's no righteousness in me. There's nothing in me but sin. I have no claim on God. I can't present anything before God in hopes that he would reward me. And, and, and all my hope is that the glory of God is in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure, this precious oil in an earthen vessel. What's the earthen vessel? That's our old man. That's our old nature. That's our Adamic, Adamic nature. That's, that's, that's Jacob. Um, that's, the, that's, our, that's how we're born. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power might be of God and not of us. Now, whatever I get from God, now, whatever prayers I'm able to express to God and whatever faith I have, he gets all the glory for it. Because all I, can, all I had to contribute was this earthen vessel. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about the body, in the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. You see, this gospel is constantly killing us, isn't it? <laughs> it's, constantly, it's constantly exposing us for what we are. It's constantly causing us to bow and to say, the Lord Jesus Christ is my life. You remember where, you remember where he gets the poor from? He gets the poor from the dust of the earth. <laughs> And, uh, and we saw that in the Psalms a couple of weeks ago, that, that we know that we're poor when God makes us to see that we have no life outside of Christ. That, that God, if I have any life before God, it's going, to be, it's going to be the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He is my life. And so Paul says this, this earthen vessel reminds me. It's a constant reminder that I'm dead <laughs> and that, that the only life I have is the life that I receive from Christ. For we which live, verse 11, are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be manifest in our mortal flesh. Christ is my life. Paul said I was crucified with Christ. And this goes right along with this psalm. As the Lord Jesus is, is crying out from the cross and, 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 um, and he's, he's offering up his life to the Father for the sins of his people. And Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. When Christ died, I died. Nevertheless, I live. Yet it's not I. It's Christ that liveth in me. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. So it's his faith. I believe, therefore I have spoken. He's my righteousness. He's my justification. And I'm brought constantly to this point of death, acknowledging that I have nothing to contribute to my salvation. So then, death worketh in us, but life in you. As we're brought to acknowledge our death, our death brings forth life. And in that, in that Christ is going to get all the glory for our life, or he, won't, or he won't be our life. Look at verse 13. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed. And therefore have I spoken, we also believed, and uh, therefore speak. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. So, 
Paul's looking back to Psalm 116 as he's being inspired of the Spirit of God to write. And he said, as it is written, <laughs> uh, I believed, therefore I have spoken. I was, I was dead, and yet now I'm made alive. Um, faith, faith is believing that the Lord Jesus Christ received from the Father everything that he asked God for. Everything. And that if you and I are going to get anything from God, we're going to have to pray in faith, <laughs> looking to the Lord Jesus Christ for all of our justification and all our righteousness before God. So we read this prayer Psalm, Psalm 116. And the commentaries miss this. I, I, I read what other men have written about Scripture, and it's amazing how, how the, the self-professed theologians um, don't see Christ in this. Um, verse 1 of Psalm 116, I love the Lord. Because he hath heard my voice and my supplication. <laughs> the Lord Jesus is saying, Father, you've heard everything I've asked you. Now, we do love him. We love him. But we love him because he first loved us. And, uh, and it is that love that constraineth us. And it's the love of God that calls us. And it's, and it's the goodness of God that brings us to repentance. And and. and and yet, here we see the Lord Jesus Christ saying, I love my Father because everything I've ever asked him for, he's given to me. Everything I needed, he's provided. Because he hath inclined his ear unto me, therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. <laughs> There's our hope, brethren. There's our hope. We come before the throne of grace looking in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ, believing that God gave him everything that he asked for, then we can come with confidence. Isn't that what Scripture says? That we're to come before the throne of grace with boldness. That word boldness means confidence, not confidence in ourselves, not confidence even in our prayers, but confident that the Lord Jesus Christ received everything he asked the Father for. What was, the, what was the very first thing the Lord Jesus asked the Father for on Calvary's cross that we have recorded in Scripture that he asked verbally for, audibly for, that we could hear and, and, and write down? What was the first thing he said? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. How true is that? You and I don't have a clue what sin is. We really don't. Our conscience convicts us when we do something bad and do something wrong. But to understand that the Lord Jesus Christ is the only one that understood what sin was. He's the only one that felt the full shame of it. He's the only one that felt the burden of it. He's the only one that knew how offensive it was to God. You and I are so accustomed to it. It doesn't bother us much, does it? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. <laughs> That's still true, isn't it? But here's our hope. Here's our hope. We can come into the presence of a holy God, knowing that the Father answered all the supplications that the Lord Jesus Christ offered. And the hope of us receiving forgiveness of sin is not based on how sorry we are, or how repentant we are, or how much we're determined to not do it again. But our hope of being forgiven of sin is that he heard his supplication. And he put away the sins of his people once and for all. He hath inclined his ear unto me. Look at, look at verse 3. The sorrows of death compassed me. 
The pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. We, we taste a little bit of this when the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin. When we come to see that, that our sin is rooted in our own unbelief. And that if, and if the Lord Jesus doesn't stand in our stead, if he doesn't bear our sins before God, if he doesn't put them away by the sacrifice of himself and cover them by his shed blood, that, that we'll go to hell. We'll, we'll never know God. We'll never receive anything from God. And, they, and to some degree, we experience that, that hell has got hold of me. <laughs> Lord, I, I, this, is, this is a problem I've got that I can't do anything about. You know, everything else, we can, make, we can make some efforts to work things out, can't we? But not this. Not this. Lord, I've got a, I've got a sin problem with you that I'm going to have to have Christ to, to solve for me. The sorrows of death compassed me and the pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then called I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. And we do. We call upon the name of the Lord. Deliver me, Lord. Deliver me. But our faith, when we're calling upon the name of the Lord, is not in our prayers. It's not in our sincerity. It's not in our faith. We, we ask in faith. We pray in faith, not wavering, not like the waves of the sea, tossed to and fro, not being double-minded, looking to works plus grace. No, we're, we're believing that the Lord Jesus Christ beseeched the Father on our behalf. <laughs> And we're looking to his accomplished work and his glorious person as the hope of our salvation. I believed, therefore I have spoken. <laughs> God has given us faith to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore we can speak. We can speak the truth about Christ. We can speak the truth about ourselves. And we can speak to God. We can go into the very presence of God. Not... Not in faith believing that if we just believe hard enough that God will be obligated to give it to us. But in faith believing that if we're going to get anything from God, it's going to be because, it, it will be because of what the Lord Jesus Christ did. <laughs> Gracious, verse 5, is the Lord and righteous. Yea, our God is merciful. He's full of grace. He's full of righteousness. And he's full of mercy. You in need of that? <laughs> you in need of grace? <laughs> Demerited favor? Grace, you don't, have, you don't have anything to do with it. It's a gift of God. Unmerited. Un uh, how can we say it? It's all of God. Grace, grace unto it. And mercy? Are you in need of God to, you know what the difference between grace and mercy is. Grace is that which God gives us that we don't deserve. And mercy is that which God withholds from us that we do deserve. <laughs> and we need both, don't we? <laughs> we need God to give us the gift of life and we need to him to withhold us the curse of death. And uh, that's what he does. Grace and mercy. And uh, righteousness, gracious is the Lord and righteous, yea, our God is merciful. And he delights in showing mercy. He's not reluctant to show mercy. <laughs> hey, we come into the presence of, here, here's the thing about it. God honors those who honor his son. So when we come into the presence of God, honoring the Lord Jesus Christ, for all our standing before God, God honors that prayer. If we come 
thinking, well, you know, I just pray a little longer and pray a little harder and be a little more sincere. Maybe if I shed a few tears, maybe if I do a little bit over here, a little bit over there, quit doing this, start doing that, make up what we're doing. We're double-minded, unstable in all of our ways. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything from the Lord. Look at verse 6. The Lord preserveth the simple. Singular. (laughs) What did uh, Paul said? I I fear lest as Eve was deceived by the serpent in the garden that you should be drawn away from that simplicity. That simplicity which is in Christ. Christ. The singularity of the Lord Jesus Christ being all our righteousness and all the hope of our salvation and all of our access before God. He preserveth the simple. I was brought low. (laughs) And that's what the gospel does, doesn't it? It brings us low. It kills us. It puts us to death. It shows us our inability to bring anything before God. And it causes us to look to Christ alone for all of our life. And the Lord Jesus Christ is saying, I was brought low. And he helped me. Oh, he was. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We don't, we don't know what the Lord Jesus went through on Calvary's cross. We don't know what that cup was that he drank from. We can't, we can't enter into that. We can believe it. We can't feel it. We can't understand it. Not sufficiently. The Spirit of God gives us a little, a little experience, but we don't look to that experience. God said, believe. The Lord Jesus Christ drank damnation dry. He drank the bitter dregs of that cup. But he prayed, Father, if there be any way this cup can pass from me, let it be. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And this psalm goes on to say, talk about that cup. Verse 7. Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. There's no place to rest other than the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our rest. The work was finished before the foundation of the world, Hebrews chapter 4. And, and, and Christ is our rest. There's no, there's no rest. There's no hope. There's no, there's no peace outside of Christ. Return. How often we have to... You see, we're, we're prone to wander, aren't we? We're prone to be double-minded and to be unstable, not just between the flesh and the spirit, but to kind of have those, you know, there's there's a Pharisee in every one of us, isn't there? It's like my brother Angus said, Angus Fisher, he said, I'm a whole lot more concerned about that Pharisee in here than I am the one out there. And, and, and he's, he's there, isn't he? Um. why we have to keep hearing the gospel isn't it <laughs> and bring us back to christ <laughs> oh bring me back to christ show me that christ is all i've got and he's all i need and he's all god's pleased with god make me to be pleased with christ christ alone for thou hast delivered my soul look at Look at uh, verse 7. Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. Return, return. How many times do we have to return? How many times do you have to return? Oh, we don't return as often as we should, do we? We return a lot, don't we? We find ourselves, our faith is renewed, Dave, but this is called sanctification. It's being called being kept by God. It is the Lord that turns us. And causes us to return. And aren't you glad he does? He's got us on a leash, doesn't he? (laughs) And that's a good place to be. Be God's dog on God's leash. (laughs) And he can pull us back before before we go over the brink. I'm so thankful for that. Return unto thy rest. For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. 
There's the Lord Jesus. When he's crying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He, he's, he's pouring out his soul to the Father. He's, the Father's forsaken him. He's become sin. When the, when, when, God, when the Holy God saw our sin on his Son, he had no choice but to forsake him. And not just forsake him, but slay him. It pleased the Father to bruise him. It was God that put the Lord Jesus Christ to death because of sin. And now Christ is crying out to the Father. But he's saying, in all of this forsaking, and in all this burden, and all this sorrow, and all this sin that's been piled on me, I know that my God is gracious. I know he's righteous. I know he's merciful. I know that he will preserve me. He will return me to my rest. And he will deliver me from death. (laughs) How do you know that? Because those things were promised in the covenant of grace. And the Lord Jesus Christ believed his father. And the only way you and I are going to be delivered from death is look to Christ who was delivered from death. He is the firstborn among many brethren. That's a reference to his resurrection, not his physical birth. He's the firstborn among many brethren. Mine eyes from tears, my feet from falling. (laughs) Oh, how often we stumble and what tears we shed in this world. Lots Lots of things to be sorry about in this world, aren't there? There's sorrow and there's death. And what do we read? What do we read in the scriptures in the book of Revelation? In that day, there'd be no more death. There'd be no more sorrow. No more tears. No more sin. Why? Because just as the Father delivered the Son, so he delivers all those who look to the Son and rest their hope in the Son. Look at verse 9. And brethren, this is, this is more real to me. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. <laughs> when, I, when I awake in his likeness, I shall be satisfied. <laughs> oh, to see him as he is and be made like him. To walk with him in the land of the living. To be without sin for this mortal to be made immortal. That's, that's, what else, what else matters? What else really matters? What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? You know, the world's not concerned with these things. God puts on the hearts of his children a concern for their soul and a, hopelessness outside of Christ for the salvation of their souls. They've they've got to have Christ. I believe, therefore I've spoken. Paul said, I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded. I am absolutely persuaded that he is able. I'm not, but he is. Verse 10, I believe, therefore have I spoken. I was greatly afflicted. I said in my haste. Now, don't misunderstand. He, this, verse, this verse doesn't mean I said hastily. This word haste means in my sorrow or in, my, in the time when I was being pressed. This is Christ on the cross. I said when I was being pressed, all men are liars. He's not saying, I said hastily. Now, you know what this means. We ought to be truthful people to one another. We ought to be faithful to our word, faithful to our promises. Uh, we, Isaiah says that God's children don't lie when it comes to the gospel. They tell the truth about God. They tell the truth about themselves. They tell the truth about how it is that God's pleased to save sinners. They don't lie. And yet... We're always, we're always covering ourselves, aren't we? <laughs> we, the Lord's the only one. I mean, we, I, I made this statement a couple weeks ago. It's good to have a filter. It's good to have a filter between your between your mind and your mouth. You know, I mean, that's a good thing. 
But you know, God doesn't have to have a filter. He did. We do. <laughs> Why? Because all men are liars. And we don't want, to, we don't want people to... Uh, David spoke in one of the Psalms, I think Psalm 72. He said, if I, if I told other people what I was thinking... It would just be a discouragement to them. People don't want to know what's in your heart. You got things in your heart you can only talk to God about. Why? Because we're all a bunch of liars. God alone tells the truth. And here's the Lord Jesus. He says, I said when I was pressed, I'm looking for some deliverance. I'm looking for some help. I'm looking for someone to help me. But I look around and all men are liars. They've all forsaken me. I can't trust them. Not to save me. And you and I can't save. We can't save each other. We can't look to men to save us. What shall I render? Look at this. This is glorious. I'm, I may come back to this verse Sunday and preach a message on it. Uh, there's just so much in this. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? Now here's the question. What can I give to God for all that he's blessed me with? <laughs> and I want you to notice the answer. I will take. And I will call. Now, is that giving? <laughs> the question is, what can I give to God for what he's given to me? And the answer is, I'm going to take from him the cup of salvation. And I'm going to call upon the name of the Lord. I've got nothing I can give God. All I can do is take from the cup of salvation. How do we take from the cup of salvation? We look to the one who drank that cup dry. That's what we do. That's how we take from the cup of salvation. How do we call upon the name of the Lord? We call upon the one who called upon his father and said, Father, I will love you because you have heard all my supplications. What shall I give to the Lord? What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? And the self-righteous religionists will say, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to start serving God. I'm going to do more for God. I'm going to, I'm going to read my Bible more and I'm going to do those things. You know, the Lord... We ought to be reading our Bibles more. We ought to be praying more. We ought to be doing more. But don't look to that as rendering back to God uh, for his benefits. Take from the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. He's the giver and we're the receiver. God doesn't need anything from us. Oh, but how much we need from him. I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all of his people. And that's exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ was doing on Calvary's cross. He had made a vow. He had made a promise with his father. Back before the stars were made. Before the angels were created. In eternity past. When there was no time. The Lord Jesus Christ stood as our surety before his father in the covenant of grace and promised to redeem those whom God had chosen. And now he's saying on the cross, I am paying my vows in the sight of all the people. This thing was not done in a corner. This thing was done publicly. The Lord Jesus Christ paying to his, he wasn't paying anything to us. Christ didn't die on Calvary's cross to make us an offer of salvation. He died on Calvary's cross to make himself an offering to the Father for the salvation of his people. And the Father accepted what he did. And we'll finish with verse 15. Look at verse 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. When did all the saints of God die? When did they die? I've already quoted that passage from Colossians where Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. 
Every one of God's elect was in Christ. We were, we were in his, we, we were his seed in him. And precious in the sight of God was the death of all of his saints. When do we die? We die daily. We just read that over there in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. When Paul quoted from this passage and he said, I die daily. We're brought to recognize our own spiritual deadness before God that we might receive life in Christ. And that's done daily. He renews our faith day by day. And then one day, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. One day, God's going to cause us each to draw our last breath, and precious will it be in his sight when he ushers us into his presence and into glory. Precious in the eyes of the Lord are the death of his saints. Our merciful Heavenly Father, we ask that you would increase our faith and cause us, Lord, to rest all our hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Number 224. Let's stand together. 224.
But I know whom I am believing and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day.